Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hello, I'm Evgeny. Hi, I'm Dimitri. We are here, Bob from Netsco, and we're going to talk about SASE for Outbound. Bob, can you please introduce Netsco and what you guys do? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Eugenie, and uh, thank you, Dimitri, for inviting me uh, to what sounds like your first uh, kickoff of this type of uh, podcast series. So very excited to, uh, to join you guys today and spend some time talking about uh, a very exciting topic of SASE. So, uh, so yeah, so my name's Bob Gilbert. I'm uh, VP and Chief Evangelist of Netscope. And uh, hopefully, you know, as we talk about SASE, uh, think of Netscope as a as a modern cloud security platform, and uh, think of it as as a way to give uh, security and network teams a a different way of thinking about their architecture in light of the changing world around us, and so a modernized approach. And uh, so, you know, uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so let's start with our first question. What's the name of the offering addressing the outbound browsing? Yeah, so, so the overall solution that Netscope provides is called the Netscope Security Cloud. And, um, you know, when you, when you think of what that is, uh, that encompasses a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, under the, uh, the SASE umbrella, right? And, you know, from, uh, you know, if you look at, Gartner's definition of SASE. Uh, there's core components of, uh, you know, secure web gateway, cloud access security brokers, uh, you know, zero trust network access, SD-WAN and, and firewall as, as a service. And our solution is really centered around SASE. And it covers everything except for SD-WAN and firewall as a service natively. And the way that we cover those components uh, is through partnerships. So uh, a lot of uh, integration points, and we can talk more about that later uh, uh, with, with SD-WAN, um, but Netscope Security Cloud. Nice. So looks like you guys capture really a lot on the SASE platform, and I hope in the next episodes and parts of our podcast, we'll talk about the other parts, like remote access and CASD. For now, let's talk about the outbound part. So tell me a bit about the maturity of the outbound part of your products. How long you've been around? How yeah. you describe how mature it is? That's a, that's a great question. So um, I personally have been with the company for about six years. Um, we actually deployed our first inline cloud proxy in 2013. And this was centered around CASB, but it was, it was, it was inline CASB, so it really a, a cloud proxy. And if you fast forward to today, we have more than a thousand customers, including some of the largest organizations in the world that are using the Netscope Security Cloud. So we're, we're processing uh, quite a bit of, of traffic for some very large organizations um, across you know, cloud and web usage. And I can share some, some numbers around that in a, in a little bit. So the next question uh, would be around the licensing of the product. How would you license your product to your customers? Is it by user, devices, concurrent connections, or based on the bandwidth they're consuming? Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question. Again, um, it's per user, um, so it's 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 cloud friendly pricing. Um, you know, based on per user contracts, uh, one year, two year, three year year contracts, and so nothing outside of that. It's uh, it's it's very straightforward. You count how many users you have and the security capabilities that you want to apply to those users and that, and, and that dictates your per user price. Is the user mean one device or user mean several devices? It, it could be, it could be uh, several devices. It's, it's based on a, on a per user seat. Okay, so because right now I have a laptop, an iPad <laughs> and, a t and a phone, so at least three devices. And they can all yeah. be at the same time, right? That is correct. Yeah. So, uh, uh, like, like you, I, I think I actually have like six or seven devices. So I would be counted as one user, even though I'm going across different devices. Okay. okay. Let's move on and talk about architecture. 
So describing the high level, we will talk later on about more in depth, Netscope architecture. Cloud, yes. time, locations. Do you want to share your screen maybe or share, share, share a diagram? Yeah, let me, um, you know, I think uh, uh, I only have two slides to show. And um, if you can see my screen here, uh, yes. this first slide is a high level view of our platform. And uh, what's interesting about this is it's 100% cloud native. Um, you know, I came from a company uh, years ago called Riverbed that, um, you know, we shipped an orange appliance uh, to enterprises around the world, deployed at many branch offices and data centers. And this is basically a cloud native solution that when customers purchase it, we give them a login to this. But what's behind this login is a, a, a very powerful set of uh, cloud security services. So if you look at the, uh, the orange boxes here, this kind of represents the uh, some of the, the, the functionality pillars of the platform. Uh, it starts with a next-gen secure web gateway. And when we call that next-gen, and we'll get into some of the details of that, because what we've effectively done is we've combined uh, an inline proxy uh, covering you know, cloud, so inline CASB with secure web gateway with cloud DLP kind of all formulated in, into one. We call that a next-gen secure web gateway. Uh, CASB uh, was the first product that we that we shipped uh, way back in, in in 2013, primarily focused on on uh, use cases around protecting data at rest in managed cloud applications like Office 365, and then public cloud security is all about protecting data in environments like AWS, Azure, and GCP. So, uh, you know, ensuring that your your policy configuration is is um, is compliant, uh, your, your posture is right with cl cloud security posture management. And then private access is the zero trust network access component of our solution. And that's all about providing fast and secure access to private applications that are hosted either in your own data center or in the public cloud. So those are kind of the, the functional areas. Now the blue boxes is really interesting because these are the, uh, the security microservices that we apply to uh, the areas of functionality. And what's interesting about these is uh, this is 100% you know, cloud native, uh, horizontally scalable. Uh, so you can uh, apply uh, services like data protection and threat protection across SaaS, IaaS, and web. Um, with one platform. Um, what's interesting also is you log into the platform with one console and there's effectively, uh, you know, one console, one policy engine, uh, one pass uh, DLP, one analytics system, and one steering client for getting traffic uh, to the Netscope Security Cloud for real-time visibility and control. And then finally, the last uh, two points I want to point out here is uh, in this box on the bottom uh, is, is some of our, 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 our secret sauce. And one is the ability to uh, decode and extract rich contextual detail about cloud and web usage in a way that other vendors cannot. And that's important for identifying uh, risky behaviors, activities, uh, data movement that's, that's uh, going to places that's hard to detect. Um, and then it runs on um, what we call New Edge, which is one of the world's fastest and largest security networks, uh, Netscope uh, New Edge. And then finally, over to the right here is um, we built the platform uh, to be open and integrated. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, we'll talk more about that uh, in, in a little bit, but um, we truly believe to allow customers to really unlock uh, the capabilities of some of their existing security investments to cover more workflows by adding those to Netscope to, to unlock uh, capabilities. So, so that's kind of the high level. From an architecture standpoint, the way I like to look at it is if you think of, of what we're protecting, um, it starts with uh, cloud applications. And if you look at, you know, there's two areas of cloud applications. There's the managed applications that IT has administrative access to the Office 365, uh, you know, perhaps there's, there's Salesforce and, and, and other applications. And then there's the, the unmanaged applications 
that um, are brought in by users and lines of business. And what's interesting about this is that today, um, about 95% of cloud application usage in the enterprise is driven by unmanaged cloud applications so not managed by IT. So in order to uh, cover this, um, we also, uh, you know, from a, uh, you know, from a, a target standpoint, we cover uh, website traffic as well. I mentioned uh, public cloud environments. Um, and then, so to cover that, when you think of the Netscope security cloud, um, running on New Edge, how do you get users from managed devices uh, to be able to cover that infrastructure? And this is where our cloud native proxy uh, comes into play and our next gen secure web gateway uh, comes into play. So here we're able to inspect all cloud and web traffic in real time um, going, you know, for users accessing those services, uh, you know, both, both going there and, and, and coming back and applying advanced data and threat protection uh, to those environments. There's a number of different deployment options that allow, uh, you know, to get traffic to the Netscope security cloud. Uh, from managed devices, uh, one common way is you deploy a Netscope steering client that goes on the, on the managed endpoint. And then we also have options for users that are in a, you know, on-premises sitting in an office or at, a, at headquarters uh, where you can actually uh, steer that, that user's traffic uh, using, um, you know, an on-premises uh, footprint to get traffic to the, to the cloud as well. So, so once, you, once you do that, the other um, interesting use case here is what about users that are on unmanaged devices that you can't put a footprint uh, on that user's uh, device? And this is where a reverse proxy comes into play. So as part of the Netscope Security Cloud, one of the deployment options is you deploy a reverse proxy. So when users connect to their managed cloud applications uh, like Office 365, Box, et cetera, uh, they go through our, our reverse proxy. It integrates with uh, identity providers from Okta, Ping, Microsoft, et cetera. And it allows us to steer those unmanaged user traffic to the Netscope Security Cloud even without putting a, a, you know, anything on, on the endpoint. Um, and then finally, there's the notion of uh, what about, that's, you know, that's the inline proxy capabilities, but there's also protecting data at rest that's sitting there in uh, managed cloud services. So this is where our API enabled protection comes into play. So we have APIs for about 20 different cloud services where we can inspect um, the content that is at rest in those cloud services and then apply policies to that content, whether you're looking for things like uh, malware or sensitive data that's being exposed in places it can't. That's where API-enabled protection comes I think Cosby is apparently not a two-minute conversation. It, it, need, it needs in the, the entire show by itself. Yeah, isn't, isn't that interesting? And then finally, the, the, the last part of it is... Um, the public cloud security. So this is, uh, you know, this is where public cloud security and also accessing private applications. So for private apps, it's, it, you know, the re really the way you tackle that scenario is with zero trust network access. So this is using the same client footprint. Um, you're basically providing the ability to get fast and secure access directly to those uh, private applications that are hosted either in your data center or your public cloud. Now, what's, what's beautiful about this architecture is that it's, again, we're doing all of this with this one uh, platform. So again, it's, it's- And is this replicated across the world? And you mentioned private cloud. I'm guessing you're not using public IIS, like AWS, Azure, GCP. So yes, tell us so, about so this architecture is, a bit. Yeah, so so that is a, a um, let me uh, get rid of that get rid of that here. So that is a uh, a good question. And when you when you think of uh, uh, Netscope, um, you know basically, uh, you know when when one of our core architectural tenets when we started out from the get go uh, was to not use the public cloud. The, the, you know there's there's a lot of challenges with using the public cloud. You can't simply take your security controls 
and you know, think of it as an appliance, moving that appliance footprint to the cloud so you could deliver security from the cloud. And I think one of our competitors um, puts it really well just to give them kudos, which is, uh, you know, that's like saying, hey, let's stick, uh, you know, a uh, uh, thousand DVDs in AWS uh, and let's call it Netflix, right? You just, that's something you don't do. Um, so, so the idea here is, you know, one of the challenges with the public cloud is, you know, it's great for compute resources and, and what have you, but it's not good for uh, delivering uh, packets from, from one point to the other. Um, it's, there's a lot of challenges with, uh, with performance and, and congestion, and it results in, in you know, uh, poor end user experience. So, so what, we've, what we've effectively done is uh, we have uh, built what is essentially the, uh, the one, you know, one of the world's largest and fastest uh, security networks. Think of it as an overlay uh, to the internet, internet. We call it Netscope New Edge. Now this is a, a $100 million investment. <laughs> so this isn't a, a small task, right? And it enables us to deliver advanced inline security. Think of it without impacting end user experience. Uh, our New Edge network consists of more than 45 global data centers. Um, Netscope customers can uh, be served by any point of presence globally. And it's, it's also highly available. So if there's unexpected issues uh, with their default point of presence, they're automatically routed to another uh, point of presence. Um, but it's also optimized for, uh, for performance. And a lot of work has gone into uh, not using the public cloud to make sure that those users as they're accessing, whether it's Office 365 or general websites, uh, they have a, a good experience and also a secure experience. Gotcha. Great, this explains really well. And you answer also about Okta. I guess, do you tie back to other IAM solution as well or Azure AD? Yeah, so so we actually we integrate with with IDPs like Okta, Ping, Microsoft, Centrify, and others. Um, you know, there's there's tight integration for for authentication uh, workflows. Um, you know, irrespective of whether you're using our our inline proxy, uh, forward proxy, or you're using a, a reverse proxy where we uh, have you know SAML uh, integration, etc. We also integrate with them by, um, you know, for example, with Okta, we can, we can uh, uh, support step up authentication workflows and make that as part of policy. Uh, so when you're uh, creating a policy based on uh, a certain condition or activity or, or what have you, you can make the action you take, not just block, but you can actually step that user up, uh, you know, based on a set of conditions. And we do that with, uh, by integrating with, with the IDPs. Excellent. Um, so you also talked a little bit about the scale uh, of your solution, right? Uh, using your own servers in your own data centers. How are you making your user browsing better and uh, faster? I mean, do you have any offloading to the local machine? Because, you know, if, if you're going to check every single request on the cloud or in, as part of the solution itself, there is always the latency of sending the data yeah. and receiving the data. So how, how you know, do you go around that? Yeah, there's, there's been a, a longstanding trade-off uh, between security and performance. And, and we all know this, right? This is, a, you know, this is one of those architectural kind of political arguments that we could probably spend a whole podcast uh, talking about. And you know, we built our platform to address that. So uh, you don't have to make uh, that trade-off. So in addition to providing uh, low latency global reach, our network interconnects with consumer and last mile providers. So it optimizes the connection from the user to their destination, whether they're going to cloud and websites. Um, it's also our, our new edge points of presence are also collated in, in, in data centers and connected to all major consumer and commercial networks as well. So, so basically what that means is traffic from Netscope customers is routed via the fast path uh, to the Netscope security cloud and then to the application or website being accessed. Um, so the idea here is uh, 
you know, it's uh, in, a, in a formal life, one of the sayings we used to say is uh, the fastest trip you can ever take, and this is coming from an optimization company, is the, is the trip you don't take, right? <laughs> and and if, you, if you think of a lot of architectures out there that hairpin uh, data back through a data center to take unnecessary trips, or they rely on the public internet where you have no control over the path, um, addressing those two conditions are gonna make sure that you don't have to take those trips. So, so optimizing it gives you two advantages. One is that you're able to deliver all of these uh, robust security services from inline DLP inspection and, and malware inspection and granular controls, real-time controls, without impacting end user experience and then there's also a number of conditions where you actually improve the performance without having the proxy in place because all of a sudden you get to run on the Netscope uh, New Edge network. It's becoming better than the ISP. Yeah, exactly. So tell me this. If I'm in Europe and I want to browse a website in Canada or US, yeah, how will this connection go? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. When you think of our um, you know, 45 global uh, points of presence and wherever you are, um, we are gonna be, we've architected this where we're essentially less than 20 milliseconds from virtually every person on earth, right? So we're gonna get you first on that first hop uh, to the, uh, the closest Netscope point of presence. And then through everything I just talked about with our peering relationships, with our uh, optimizations that we have, we're going to get you to your destination at a at a fast and rapid clip. And by the way, with security services that are attached to that to that. So I'm going well. to the net to the Netscope cloud peering in Europe, and then I'm using your network to get to us. That or is just going... that is correct. You are using our network, so you're not you're this not all of a sudden fast. jumping okay. on a on a public uh, public internet. Uh, you know, connection. Gotcha. That's so why like it's fast. It's like a priority line, basically, you're saying. You got it, exactly. Nice. So let's move to architecture questions, even kind of a bit lower on the level, and let's talk about office connectivity. You mentioned in your diagrams that there's multiple ways to connect. And I want to touch on office first and then touch on the end user later. Let's start from the office. What's my options? Yeah, so so when you when you connect to the office, um, you know uh, there's a number of options. Uh, one is the Netscope steering client that I talked about. Um, that's going to give that user on the managed endpoint uh, wherever they connect from. Uh, it could be uh, the office. <laughs> it could be remote. It could we're all working from home. It could be working from home. Uh, we also have the ability to steer that user's traffic when they're in an office. Uh, using, you know, setting up like a, a GRE IPsec tunnel uh, to the Netscope security cloud. Uh, that is another, another optional uh, deployment that you, can, uh, that you can perform. And then the, the other way that we could do it is we have a number of SD-WAN partners that um, already provide kind of that, that uh, lo local network breakout. They, uh, you know, they provide uh, kind of this, the, the modern network infrastructure for those users, uh, you know, uh, connecting to the network. So we have integration with them. Again, we're setting up IPsec or GL, GRE tunnels between Netscope and the SD-WAN solution. Traffic is then routed to Netscope for visibility, control, and protection on top of that SD-WAN uh, infrastructure. It's, it's really a, a seamless uh, integration. That involves so several a simple several tunnel questions. configuration. Yeah. Several questions here. So you mentioned tunnel. If I have 50 offices or 100 offices, yeah. and there is a partnership with the SDVM provider, is there, is there a way to automate the configuration? Because I don't want to go office by office and configure it manually. Is there a better way to do this? Right. So, so uh, in, inherently, uh, you know, this is a, a, a common configuration. There's, uh, you know, we've, we've had very large deployments uh, that have been that have taken uh, in less than a week uh, to, to, to deploy out. So, um, you know, typically one of the benefits of, of SD-WAN is that you have kind of the central notion of, of configuration, right? 
So it's being able to take advantage of that, of that central notion of, of, of configuration. Um, and remember, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're basically configuring from the Netscope Security Cloud, you're doing that, that centrally as well. Um, so you're performing that, uh, that, that you know, uh, a tunnel configuration. So you're not provisioning to the SD-WAN, but you're matching configuration on, on, on each side. Right, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Always a question customers ask, GRE or IPsec? Yeah, you know what? Uh, for us, we don't care. <laughs> uh, what we've found is that uh, it depends on the SD WAN vendor, right? Um, there's there's different levels of of um, you know uh, support that they have um, with regards to industry standards around I, you know IPsec or GRE, and uh, we have some vendors that work better with IPsec. Uh, some vendors that work better with GRE. It depends on their implementation. Um, we Benus, work with both of them. Limitation. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm not gonna. I can't. I'm not gonna mention any any particular uh, name. No, 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 no. I mean bandwidth. If there's a bandwidth limitation on GRE or IPsec, and there's a difference. Yeah. So, so for again, for us, there's no limitation with with our implementation. We're gonna work with 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 either of them, and it's it doesn't come down to a bandwidth limitation. It's, it's more of a, you know, sometimes some vendors uh, haven't gotten the, uh, the full su support of things like, uh, you know, the, uh, the ciphers uh, that are in place to, to, that meet up to the industry standard. So we would recommend, oh, you, you, you probably want to do IPsec then instead of. You mentioned the end user agent, also an option from the office, but also work remotely as we right now work remotely. Let's talk about this a bit more. What's my options? Uh, what kind of ports and protocols do I route right now? Can I disable because I don't like Netscope, you know, and I want to go somewhere <laughs> that's supposed to go? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a common question. So first and foremost, um, our platform covers all cloud and web traffic, so port 80, 443. Um, but it's also important to, you know, if this is a conversation seven, eight, ten years ago, we may be saying, what ports do you cover, right? And And really, you got to take a step back, right? More importantly, um, we provide deep inspection that goes beyond simply looking at URLs, right? Um, this is important because 85% of today's web traffic is cloud and the language of the cloud is complex and it consists of JSON and API communications. So we have a patented technology that can decode API and JSON traffic and extract rich contextual details about cloud usage. Um, so when you talk to a vendor that is architected to look at HTTP, um, you know, asking them, you know, what ports you cover, uh, it's, it's probably worth having a, a, a follow on discussion on how well do you cover those ports and how, how deep. Okay. And it's, this is, this uh, is one of our, this is one of our question. strengths, uh, our bread and butters, right? Gotcha. Does people ask for additional ports coverage, like the full spectrum, DNS, SSH, or any, you know, the entire tunneling of the entire traffic? Is this a request yeah, you know that, often come? You know, that's, that's one of the, uh, the SASE um, configurations, right, is firewall as a service. And, and all you're meaning by, by file, firewall as a service is you're now doing all ports and protocols, right, uh, for, for your, you know, egress uh, traffic, et cetera. And um, we don't, you know, uh, currently that hasn't been a, 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 you know, our priority use case that we're driving. The way we typically tackle additional ports and protocols is with our zero trust network access solution, because that's all ports and protocols, right? So, okay. so you kind Fair. of solve that use case through zero trust network access, and then you apply the next gen secure up gateway to all port 80 and 443 traffic using all the advanced stuff that we do. Is something preventing me to remove the, the client? Can I oh, also protect? I, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't uh, uh, dancing around that uh, on, on, <laughs> on purpose, right? So, so um, for, uh, for Netscope, um, when, you, when you look at uh, 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 what we do, um, so from a Netscope client, you, you have a, a number of options. Um, one is you can, an administrator can hide 
uh, the client from the toolbar, um, you know, uh, so they can't see it. Uh, you can also uh, configure it so if they try to uh, uninstall it um, or disable it as a, as a service, uh, they are either unable to do that or they need a password, administrator password in order to do that. So we put a lot of controls uh, in place that prevent users. The other thing that we do is uh, an interesting workflow is we work with uh, identity providers. Um, and if, if uh, you know, we have an optional configuration where when you have users that connect to uh, cloud and web services and we don't, and, and there is, uh, I'm sorry, cloud services and they're using a, um, you know, reverse proxy, uh, um, or I'm sorry, they're, 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 what we could do is we could look for the presence through the identity provider, uh, the presence of a Netscope client. If we don't see one, uh, we could force a workflow where they, they have to deploy a Netscope client in order so to access that resource. Like conditional access almost. So it's That's right, of, you got it, it. It will show them some sticky portal where they have to download and install it until then. They can That's exactly, it'll, yeah, it'll direct them business. where they have to download and install it, exactly. exactly. Can I take it to a next level? I have the client, but I don't have an antivirus. I'm not part of domain or any other conditions. Yes, mm. yes, so, so, so you can, in the Netscope Security Cloud, uh, we reflect device posture in access control, right? So you could put a policy in place um, that basically reflects device posture. Um, you know, is there, it has this device, um, you know, join the domain, right? Is there, does this device have a certificate, uh, you know, that is deployed? Does this device have the latest uh, uh, bit locker encryption on the device? So we take, we take that and, 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 and generate, uh, you know, device posture, and then you can bring that into policy when uh, giving access. Excellent. How about uh, pushing the client? Is there any way to distribute the client at scale in the organization? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the answer is yes. Um, you know, when you think of deploying Netscope, um, the client is the simplest way to get started. Um, and there's, there's a couple levels to that. One is I can do a deployment right now to you two and it would probably take me less than five minutes, right? So I would go into the Netscope console, um, I would add your email addresses, um, and it would send you an email with an invitation to deploy the client. It takes like one minute to you know, click on the install, um, and, then, and then all of a sudden you're, we're steering all your, your cloud web and private app traffic. Uh, so that's one example. Um, the other example is we have very large enterprises. I just heard of one a couple of weeks ago that uh, deployed the Netscope client to more than 50,000 endpoints. And it took just a couple of weeks as part of a staged rollout. And, and you use uh, tools like, you know, your typical SCCM or JAMP uh, to uh, deploy that infrastructure. We also integrate with MDM tools uh, to facilitate uh, deployment as well. It also includes mobile devices. That is correct. Yeah. So it's yeah. it it it's uh, you know uh, PC. Uh, you know it's Windows, Mac, uh, iOS, Android. Um, uh, we also um, um, you know we, we also support Chrome OS as well as a, as a as a deployment option. So there's there's a lot of is flexibility. Chrome there. OS popular in schools, I guess, or universities. Yeah, you, you, you hit it. It's exactly right. That's where it, the... You actually bring me to my next question. Any other options for connectivity? Maybe you work with ISP, maybe you work with OEM partners, or you plug to some other platform. Yeah, you know, um, other than, you know, we have, we have integration points with the platform with, with, with other, other products. Um, you know, we, you know, like uh, we can ingest logs from a firewall. We can connect a SIM to, you know, like Splunk or QRadar. We can connect to identity providers for various workflows. Um, but there's no like, um, you know, connectivity options, if you will. Did anybody uh, to, try to OEM you to put you as part of the router somewhere or like, I don't know, Nokia? Not, no, not, no not, not yet, not yet. Not yet. 
Great. I tell you, I have to kill you. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on and we're going to talk about Secure Web Gateway. And the reason why, because outbound browsing, it's basically in a way Secure Web Gateway. And sure. I took several capabilities from Gardner that describe in what they think Secure Gateway should have. And we're going to talk about this. One is pretty simple, and we kind of spoke already, is ability to categorize URLs by groups. So tell mm -hmm. me what you guys do, how you guys do this, and if it's OEM by somebody else or it's uh, developed by you. Yeah, that's a, um, so that is a, a core functionality of our next-gen Secure Web Gateway. So, so we support URL filtering with uh, more than 100 categories, over 200 languages that you know, we believe cover uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the active web. Um, we also support dynamic web page ratings for about 70 different categories, plus you can create custom categories. Um, in addition to that, so, so, you know, we don't come up with those categories and lists ourselves. You know, we, we use different vendors uh, for that, that that's what they specialize in. Um, but what we do do is we take that and we apply machine learning on top of that because um, you know, there's a level of efficacy that we want to achieve if, if there's miscategorizations or, or there's sites that haven't been categorized yet. How do you, you know, what, what process do you go through to, to perform and uh, is the categorization? The, is the dynamic part, this is where the machine learning going? That is correct, that is correct. So imagine, Imagine you have a website that uh, hasn't been categorized yet. It's, it's a new website and, and what have you. But fundamentally, um, you can look inside the content payload of the, of the site and, oh, that's a, that's a guns and ammo <laughs> website, right? They're talking about, you know, so this is what uh, machine weapons learning. And, what, and, and, and we, we, our, our algorithm understands that. And all of a sudden, we put that into the category of, of guns, right? Will this uh, or, is be done the before? Yeah, so this is kind of do, that'll do a question. When we will we do this? When I browse or before? And what Dimitri was asking as well. Yeah, yeah it Real would time. be, it, it, you, you have to have, you have to have, uh, you know, the sacrificial lamb, right? You, you, you can't guess where the user is going, right? So, so this is, this is basically once that user browses there, uh, we're going to do that dynamic classification. And the next time they go to that site or another user goes to that site, we now know that that's a uh, weapons category and we could, we could take action uh, from there. Um, now, now, keep in mind, this is, this is uh, URLs and, and websites and extensive database machine learning. But on top of that, we also have a database of more than 33,000 cloud apps, right? This is a a big advantage that we have uh, in the industry and our threat research team, our threat labs team um, uses more than 50 di different criteria and researches each and what, every one of those cloud apps and, and applies a risk score to that. And this is important for CISOs that want to not only understand cloud usage, uh, but also start assessing their risk. And then you could take the results of, of that research in the product and reflect that in a policy. So, you know, for example, if my users are going to any cloud storage app, and we have more than 400 different cloud storage apps in our database. If, if they're going to a cloud storage app that scores low uh, on our cloud competence index score, um, we're gonna go ahead and take action. We're, go we're gonna coach those users to use our, our our corporate managed instance of Office 365 OneDrive or, or what have you. You mentioned dynamic and categories. So yes. I'm guessing as a new customer, I can put bad categories block and you automatically block whatever you think is bad. That is correct. Yeah, that's that's pretty, that's table stakes capability that's uh, can I, been there. Uh, can I have my own blacklist? Yes, yeah, you could set up you can have your own whitelist as well. So you could set up whitelists and blacklists and, and um, you know, totally custom outside of what's out of the box. Is there, is there any interesting, uh, you know, insight that uh, were found by your threat research unit that you can share? 
Yeah, you know, there's one of the one of the uh, the interesting findings that we've, and this has been going on for um, you know quite some time, um, six months to the last year, is there's been a a, a big rise in in cloud enabled threats. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, um, threats typically have, have taken on the, uh, you know, hey, let's look at malicious payloads. Uh, let's look at malicious websites. And that's kind of, you know, core to a, to a typical proxy. But what we've seen is, is the rise in um, fileless threats and, uh, and, and spear phishing that uses cloud, cloud applications. Uh, and the whitelisting of cloud applications to actually perform uh, the spear phishing. Um, so this, there's been a, a, a big uh, rise in that. And, 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 and really what, that's, what's that, what that has led into is you gotta do more than just URL classification and, and web filtering. Uh, you have to actually understand what's going on within the URL um, to identify those those risky uh, activities and those risky behaviors, and that's a that's a big part of um, what Netscope does. I talked about earlier the uh, you know the, the the cloud traffic is is API and JSON. Yep. Uh, you know you know the context. It's, it's, it's the the context. You got to be able to decode that and extract details about the fact that you know what that uh, that 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 Google drive environment um, is is actually being used uh, that's being whitelisted is being used by bad actors uh, to serve up uh, pages that allow you to uh, basically harvest credentials right and why are they able to do that why what and first of all why did the company whitelist Google Drive that allows bad people to have access to it it's pretty simple right if you if you look at uh, typical URL filtering, you're looking at drive.google.com. You're looking at the URL, right? So you have to make a decision from a security standpoint. Do I block drive.google.com or do I allow it? Um, well, gosh, if I, if I block drive.google.com, it's the same URL that's used, whether it's the personal instance, uh, the partner instance, somebody sharing content with my marketing team from an outside Google Drive share, or it's my corporate instance of Google Drive. It doesn't matter. The URL persists across instances. So you can't block drive.google.com. You're going you're gonna to screw up the digital transformation happening, right? So, so you have to whitelist it as a security team. And there's been events in the news that's uh, uh, widely publicized that um, the bad guys are figuring that out. And they're figuring out that that this cloud whitelisting that's taking place because of lack of sort, ability yeah. to inspection, they're taking advantage of it. And and we see that um, every, it, it seems like every other day there's a new story about it. What, what will think? happen? Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, when I want to download a file from a website, tell us how you're going to inspect the file for malicious content. Yeah. So so um, when you look at uh, you know, malicious downloads. So um, first of all, um, the Netscope Security Cloud from a threat protection standpoint, we apply multiple anti-malware engines. Uh, we have 40 plus threat intel feeds. Uh, we also have our own threat labs, um, IOCs that we take. Uh, you know, we, we take anonymized data from our more than a thousand customers. We take all of that and, and we look at all traffic going to and from the cloud and web. And we're gonna block the malicious payloads uh, as, as part of that. Our system also performs deobfuscation and recursive file unpacking. And, and we sandbox portable executable uh, files as well. So it's an advanced um, threat system for, you know, I talked about the fileless side, being able to, you know, uh, detect, uh, you know, phishing and, and granular within the instance. We also inspect the payloads uh, in a very advanced way as well. What if part of the website is malicious, like a flash or something else? What you yeah. capable or not capable to do? 
Yeah, so, so that's another area that we uh, do very well in. So, um, you know, we, we use a, a number of different uh, techniques with regards to users accessing the, uh, the wild west of the, of the World Wide Web, right? Uh, so uh, part of that is we use some of the things I just talked about for files. We use that for websites as well. So, um, you know, we, we, have, we tie into uh, external feeds, uh, databases of, of uh, malicious websites, and then we look at ind indicators of compromise uh, taking place as users are accessing, uh, you know, various websites. In addition to that, we also have uh, machine learning powered behavioral analytics. Now, this is important because this isn't just, uh, you know, this is taken in context of, not just a user accessing a website and we know the, the website's malicious, but it's also taken in context of, of what is that user actually doing that, that could signal uh, malicious intent. It, 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 it could UBA? be, the, it's UBA that's built into the platform. So, so an example, two examples. One is you can have a, a user that has had their uh, credentials compromised and now they're accessing um, you know, uh, the cloud of web from a device that, hey, we've never seen that domain, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, before, or I'm sorry, we've never seen that host of that device, host name of that device before. Uh, and also we, we recognize that that user also tried to unsuccessfully log into a, some, some cloud services. So we see the, so we tie all that together. That's an external threat, but also for the insider threat, um, you know, being able to detect, uh, you know, uh, a user that, you know, uh, we have this anomaly called covering your tracks that I like to, <laughs> to demonstrate. And imagine a user uh, going into a, uh, you know, they, they uh, upload data to like Office 365 OneDrive. Uh, they share the data as soon as they upload it. After that, they delete the data. So what, why did they why did they delete the data after they shared it? So we take all of those signals and we surface uh, behavioral anomalies that could be indicative of malicious intent. And, and that's a big important part of that. And then finally, the last part of this is uh, being able to follow um, you know, the data as part of that malicious intent and, and identify things like uh, data exfiltration taking place from a, uh, a managed, cloud application where the, the data was downloaded. And then sometime later, that same uh, data, it could have been renamed by the way, uh, we have deep inspection, true, tile, true file type inspection. And then they upload that data to their personal cloud app. So we follow that data flow and can alert on that activity as well. And you can put in compensating controls to uh, make sure it doesn't happen. Great. You mentioned about Shadow IT, and because you guys are Cosby, I don't see any issues there. Talk to me about a bit of bandwidth shaping, and if customers are asking to prioritize YouTube, or they prioritize YouTube and prioritize Office 65, for example. Yeah, you know, I coming from uh, Riverbed many years ago, uh, this was a, uh, a common topic that this has been around forever, right? Since the old... Uh, uh, packeteer devices and, and performing yes. QoS and packet shaping. I know I'm bringing back some memories here. Um, this isn't a, a common use case uh, that we see. Uh, if you think of the, um, I think the, the drivers for this would be probably uh, latency sensitive and, and jitter sensitive traffic like voice, voice uh, maybe RDP as, as well. Um, we don't see QoS controls as a, as, a, as a big driver. The fact that our new edge network is already optimized for performance and provides performance overhead, uh, we've over provisioned this and plus you have uh, hyperscale uh, resources thanks to, to, to the cloud. Uh, we already deliver um, you know, great performance, low latency and, and what have you. So it's, it's not a specific use case that, that uh, we hear, I've, I've, you know, a couple of times we've heard uh, requests for this, but it's not a, not a common thing. We spoke about download of files. What about upload? Talk to me about a bit about DLP capabilities. And it's almost borderline with Cosby, like almost different conversation, but still, you know, people are- Yeah, you know, it's, and, and I think, um, 
the misnomer is that it's all about CASB and, and, and uploading of, 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 uh, of, of content to a, to a cloud service. That's one of the use cases. Um, but fundamentally, um, when, when you think of uh, uh, DLP, uh, DLP and, and data protection in general is, is a cornerstone of, of, of Netscope and one of our big differentiators. So we're often chosen uh, by organizations for the strength of our, of our DLP. And the way we think about DLP is uh, the ability to uh, apply DLP across uh, SaaS, IaaS, and web, right? So let me give you some color on, on what I mean mm -hmm. by that. So, so we have a, an enterprise-grade DL DLP system that, that uses an innovative one-pass DLP inspection uh, to cover all of these targets, SaaS, IaaS, and web. So there's not separate DLP systems or templates or, or what have you. Uh, this also covers data at rest in managed cloud applications. So it, it's kind of, it, it's independent of what the deployment uh, that, that is in place. Uh, I mentioned that we're able to follow data as it flows between cloud apps and, and also alert on data exfiltration. Now the robustness of the DLP also comes from the fact that we support 3000 data identifiers, more than a thousand file types, and, and more than 40 different uh, compliance templates. And when you think of, you know, when you started this, you said, oh, what about, what about uh, uploads of DLP? We can actually inspect the body of files, metadata, uh, data embedded in images, data being posted to social media and collaboration apps, uh, data that's going to blog posts and discussion forums. Um, and then what's, what's really exciting, our data science team has, uh, has basically launched the industry's first machine learning powered image and object detection. So we can actually identify images such as passports, driver's license numbers, even screenshots that people are taking of sensitive data. We can, we can identify that that's a screenshot huh. um, as well as objects like tax forms and resumes and whatnot. So this is machine learning powered. Um, we've trained the algorithm with, with uh, hundreds of, of, of versions of, of each of these, these objects, and it's highly accurate. Um, and, and we do that both with inline inspection, so we can, we can uh, stop, we not only alert, but, but stop uh, loss of that type of uh, data, as well as uh, so this API integration. apply for the apps you're supporting and for the documents upload you're capable? That is, that is right. That is, that is exactly right. right. Uh, and then we support advanced features like exact data match, fingerprinting, um, and probably the most important feature of DLP is the ability to bring in rich context to your policies. Um, you know, one of the challenges traditionally for DLP, uh, you know, if you go to Google and you search for DLP, Google might auto-complete and say false positives is the next thing to, to type, right? It's a, it's, it's a well-known challenge yes. with DLP. Yes, being your own. So, so, so not only do you need these, these features for accuracy, but you gotta bring it, be able to bring in context about you know, who the user, the device, the location, um, you know, the, the, uh, the application or the website, the activity they're performing, and bring that into context to, to uh, form your uh, your policy orchestration, and it's going to dramatically improve improve the uh, efficacy I'm, and reduce reduce false positives. I'm looking forward to have a separate discussion about DLP in context. We of, could talk two hours yes, about DLP. Yes, there's there's I a like lot DLP of innovation. Conversations. I agree. Yeah. I guess it's time to move on to the next section. Let's talk about the POC part. Yeah. Uh, so yep. Yep. What so. Is, Oh, yeah, how do you POC? What's the best way to POC? You mentioned a yeah. original user. Yeah, so um, you know, POC uh, runs in 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 different uh, you know different levels. Um, we've had some POCs even for large uh, some of our large customers, where they will uh, basically roll out uh, Netscope client to ten or fifteen of their um, most active users, right, and, and it, or stakeholders, if you will. Um, and then they run through a series. It's all about a use case driven POC is what's successful, right? Uh, don't just try to look for malware being downloaded from the web. Don't just try to look for uh, stopping PCI data going to a cloud application. Uh, every vendor supports that. It's really coming up with the use cases that really matter. Look for cloud enabled threats. Uh, being able to 
uh, detect that it is the personal instance of Google Drive that we talked about versus the corporate instance, et cetera, et cetera. So, so build out use cases that really drive, uh, you know, what is going to help the customer with regards to being able to achieve the outcomes uh, they need. Uh, but typical POC is um, it 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 lasts anywhere from from three days to three weeks, depending on the on the scope. We've also okay. seen some pretty comprehensive ones. Anything anything that to... the POC? I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah. Yeah, and then you mentioned it's easy to start. It's literally five minutes to get on board. Yeah, that's it. and again, if you go with the uh, the simplest deployment option, which is the Netscope client, um, again, uh, it's it's it. Uh, I can show you in just a moment, but it's uh, very very simple to uh, to get started and and roll out. I actually, when I interviewed at Netscope about six years ago, uh, with the with the team. Um, I got the offer from Netscope and I said, okay, this, this sounds like a great opportunity. I love the vision, but you have to give me the product to play with uh, for two days before I make a decision. They, they were kind of shocked. They've never had a candidate do that before. But I went home that night. Uh, they gave me a login to a Netscope tenant along with the, uh, uh, the documentation. And I ended up uh, literally, it took me uh, from scratch. I've never played with the product before. It took me 20 minutes to deploy a Netscope client to my wife's laptop, put in a policy. So what happened is my wife went to Facebook and she got a pop-up that said, uh, blocked her and it said, stop Facebooking, spend time with your husband. <laughs> and I said, I said, that's the company that I'm joining tomorrow, right? Nice. So, so, so that was a guy that, that's never played with the product that in 20 minutes I had it that's... deployed and a policy already orchestrated and I had an end user result, which happened to be my wife. And she still stayed married to me after that, by the way. This is great. <laughs> and we're almost uh, ready for the open discussion. Let's quickly talk about integration with some other vendors on the technical side. Yeah, so I think I mentioned earlier, our, our platform was built to be open and integrated. So we have partnerships with dozens of security products. And we also have tight integration with identity, SIM, EDR, and many more. Um, threat intelligence is a big area for us. And we have deep integration with vendors such as CrowdStrike and Carbon Black, where we actually support bi-directional intelligence sharing. Um, we, use a, uh, we have a capability called a, a Netscope Cloud Threat uh, Exchange. Uh, it's a plug-in system that shares IOCs back and forth between uh, a number of uh, different products. And you can actually uh, build your own plugin if you have a, a product that hasn't been uh, built yet. So, uh, so, so yeah, integration is, is, is one of the, the, the core pillars to the platform. Thank you. And uh, this brings us to the last question in this series. Uh, so what would be the three reports or metrics that can show the before and after the state uh, where I have Nesco deployed, something you know that I I would take a CISO to the board. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a, a very very important part of, uh, of again delivering customer outcomes. Um, so we talked earlier about the rich data that we collect on cloud or web usage. Um, when you think of our reports, they're used in many different ways um, from helping to perform an ongoing assessment of cloud usage risk to communicating to the board in your example. Um, now the most popular reports are the, uh, the trends in cloud adoption. Um, you know, this, this is a, we, we're, we're kind of the, the finger on the pulse of digital transformation at the organization, you know, as how is their cloud adoption increase, but even more importantly for the security team as they're, as they're uh, you know, reporting up to upper management, and making that board level um, presentation, it's being able to uh, present on the threat and data loss events that were remediated, right? It's, hey, here's our investment that we've made in this security platform, and here's what it means to the organization as far as uh, you know, helping safely enable all of this adoption of personal devices cloud usage, 
and and letting people do what they do safely. Great, thank you. We reached the open topic discussion. You mentioned about demo. I know we're running a bit out of time, but we still have time for a demo. If you have time. Yeah, let me, um, I'll do a brief, just show you a couple things. Let me uh, share my screen here. I'm gonna go ahead and make my screen a little bigger here. Okay, so here I'm gonna log into the, uh, the Netscope console. So the first thing that we are, we're, we're basically uh, showing uh, a summary of cloud and web usage uh, over the last uh, 90 days. This is my own, uh, you know, tenant here. So there's a, uh, you know, number of applications that have been used in this case, the last 90 days, percentage of applications in use or new applications over that time frame, uh, websites visited, users, byte counts, et cetera. And if I scroll down, I basically get uh, the, uh, uh, you know, usage widgets across, you know, what malicious websites have been visited, uh, malware events that, that Netscope was able to, uh, to, to, to uh, protect against, DLP incidents, as well as uh, cloud usage at, at the bottom. Now, it's also worth pointing out that uh, with the Cloud Confidence Index, this is the database that we have more than 33,000 uh, different cloud applications and each cloud application is assessed an enterprise readiness score um, that, uh, you know, based on more than, uh, you know, 50 uh, different uh, criteria. So I can uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, look at, you know, cloud storage applications like uh, Dropler. I can uh, zoom in and, and look at what the results are across these different categories, much of which is uh, modeled after the Cloud Security Alliance's Cloud Controls Matrix. This particular app scored very low. So what I can do is I could take this score and reflect it in policy. So this is kind of a little bit of the, of the, uh, the visibility, if you will. Um, I can also go and look at uh, deeper visibility, um, I get, get like a per user view. Here's uh, this view of uh, this user's uh, traffic over that same uh, trending interval, um, usage over time, activities, the geolocation of the user. Um, some of the applications uh, the user has uh, accessed, uh, websites uh, the user has, uh, has uh, uh, visited, a lot of ESPN usage, but more importantly, uh, some of the incidents that are tied to this particular user uh, with regards to, you know, have their credentials been uh, compromised in a past data breach? Are there, is there any anomalous behavior tied to this user? Uh, any uh, DLP incidents, malware events, and also uh, malicious uh, websites that have uh, been visited for that particular user. So, so that's kind of the visibility. The last part I just want to briefly show you is uh, the real-time protection. So now that I've got all cloud, web, and private app traffic uh, going from my endpoint here to the Netscope Security Cloud, and I'm working from my home office here in uh, San Ramon, California, what I can do is I can start crafting policies that uh, start uh, addressing use cases uh, for these particular, uh, for that traffic that, that uh, Netscope is, is now seeing. Uh, so, so one example here is um, I want to go ahead and uh, you know, block sensitive data, go into any discussion forum, cloud storage app, collaboration app, personal website blog, all one policy. I'm bringing in multiple DLP profiles. So I'm looking for PCI data, confidential data with this company, any passport data, et cetera, even screenshots. And then I'm gonna go ahead and block that going to any of these uh, environments. And then what I can also do is I could follow that up uh, with basically a policy that says, you know what, let's allow uh, full access if it is the corporate instance, so this is the instance awareness that we have of those different cloud services. So we're gonna allow it going to the, the corporate instance of Google Drive, Office 365 and OneDrive. So if I go to a, put on my user hat now, and let's say I go to a Google Drive and I wanna exfiltrate some data um, and I've downloaded, basically I've got this uh, uh, product roadmap data. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm in my corporate instance of Google Drive. 
So, and I have a new version of the roadmap that I need to collaborate on. I was allowed to do it because it's the corporate instance. But if I log in to my personal instance of Google Drive, and I've got this folder that says juicy data from my new employer, and I go ahead and I try to exfiltrate uh, that particular data, uh, what I'm gonna go ahead and do, let's see here, oops. I think I forgot to uh, enable Netscope, of course. So what it would normally do is it would block uh, Netscope because it detects the uh, the exfiltration. So the Block last thing I'm going to show you upload? is, oh, it yeah, also so, 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 so that is you could block the upload or the, the but the uh, the important part there you could block the download or the upload. The important part there is the upload and understanding whether it is a uh, a corporate or a personal instance. So in this example here, we were able to detect a data exfiltration activity. This was actually somebody went into Salesforce. They downloaded this object called Netscope price list. Uh oh. <laughs> and then they uploaded it to their uh, OneDrive account. So we see the sequence of events. And then you can click into this and you can, uh, you know, see this user's activity, uh, you know, during that time frame. But the key here is not only get alerted, but stop that exfiltration. Uh, from uh, from taking place. And it's important so a, because we never pass an endpoint. It all done happen in the cloud, I guess. That is exactly right. All of the the inspection, uh, all of the, uh, the the activities, um, everything that is that is uh, being processed takes place in the cloud. Here, I tried to go to this app called WeTransfer that doesn't score very well. So I have a policy in place that basically blocks access to WeTransfer. It alerts and coaches the user, and then it redirects them to the Office 365 OneDrive account. So you kind of have this, this acceptable is... use policy at, uh, in place. Well, would well, this going to be more CASB, outbound browsing, or combination between them? This is this is the this is the next gen secure web gateway. So you're you're taking inline CASB plus secure web gateway uh, plus uh, uh, inline DLP uh, to be able to ach achieve that. And the beauty of that is. If I go to uh, a website here and I try to, you know, um, you know, upload uh, some data and I can see if I have sensitive data here, it's a, it's a, it's a website. So it, uh, our DLP works across SAS, IaaS and web. And nice. whether it's a, in this case, a discussion forum post uh, or if it's going to a, a cloud application uh, and not only browser traffic, but if I open up like my Microsoft Teams application, and and again I attempt to uh, you know take data and copy and paste it in, for example, directly. This isn't even a browser, right? This is going directly in. Um, it blocks that activity from taking place too. Nice. So supports awesome. native apps, browser traffic. And then SaaS, IaaS, and web, all from the uh, the same platform and the same um, uh, same DLP engine and the same uh, Netscope client. So that's kind Thank of the, the the quick and dirty. Uh, I, I'd be happy to uh, redirect folks to uh, a lot of the uh, the demo videos that we that we have on uh, Netscope.com. You almost read my mind. If people <laughs> want to POC, if people want to learn more. What yeah. should they do? Would you let forward me some URLs? I can put in the podcast description, emails. What's the best way? Should they call yeah. the phone number? The easy way is I'm I'm Netscope's evangelist, so it's Bob at Netscope.com. And I would love to hear from you. And I'd be happy to uh, put you in touch with a local team uh, to talk about doing a POC or at least learning more about the platform. Great. We'll definitely link to your email, our LinkedIn account, and to some of the content later on. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure thank you, uh, participating in your, in your first uh, podcast series. Yes. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.